Gaming and BS episode 143. Welcome to Gaming and BS, the tabletop RPG podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome back to the show. Welcome to the show. If you've not been here before, glad to have you here. And not to be forgotten, our guest for the evening, Mr. Alex Kammer from Gamehole Con. Welcome, Alex. Again, number six, I think, t- sixth time on the show. Really? Something like that. Wow. I would have guessed three or four. That's awesome. Good for me. Yeah, good, to, good, good to chat with you guys. Thanks for having me. I thought the last, maybe it was, I think, fifth because it's an SNL, you get the jacket, but we <laughs> made a fun of the last time where you should have got a jacket, So, but maybe it's not the fifth. Well, I'm sure the jacket's in the mail. Or or we have to buy him a fifth, one of the two. I don't know. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> All right. So let's do, let's get right into announcements. Obviously, we've got Alex here, so we've got a topic to talk to him about. Also, want to hear about Game Hole. Before we get into some new stuff there, um, I'm going to be at Origins. Alex, are you going to Origins? I'm not. I'm not. And I, uh, yeah, I had travel already set. And the reason I actually, re- you know, regret that somewhat is that uh, True Dungeon is going to Origins for the first time this year, and that's a deal I help broker. Um, and uh, but so no, I'm not. Is a long, long, uh, a long way to say just no. Oh, that sucks. Anyway, I'm going to be there, so that'll be cool. This is my first uh, Origins trip, so I'm looking forward to it. And I've not been there before. It's kind of a bucket list con. I want to make sure I got to at least once. So that's coming up in like Christ, like two weeks, week and a half, something like that. And um, of course, submissions are open um, at GameholeCon. So if you want to run games under the Gaming and BS banner, that's the uh, place to do it. Um, as Sean and I said, you want to do it, get a hold of uh, Sean and I, let us know what you're looking to run. That way it helps us um, you know, pimp your game out and tell the listeners what's going on, who's doing what. And we can make sure that uh, we try to fill up your tables for you. Um, Sean, any announcements on your side before we bug Alex? No, I have you submitted your have you submitted your events yet, Brett? Nope, I'm doing that tomorrow. Got on, on the calendar. It will happen tomorrow. So, Alex, Gamehole Con, talking about you mentioned True Dungeon. You helped a broker a deal to get it to Origins. You have apart from all the other cool stuff going on at Gamehole, there are two um Two events for True Dungeon this next year, this uh, this coming May, November. You might. Yeah, correct? exactly. They're they're called runs. Uh, so there are two separate runs you can do at uh, at Game Con, just like at at uh, well at Origins. They're getting sort of a best of kind of compilation. It's what we do. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm one associated. I'm part one of the part of the ownership group for True Dungeon, so that's why I'm speaking <laughs> in the, <laughs> kind of authoritatively on the subject. Uh, that what we do when we go to a new show is uh, dip our toes in the water with um, with stuff that we've already done. So seasoned True Dungeon players will have seen this stuff before. This is just this is a basically a recruitment effort to get new players in at a new con, similar to what we had last year at GameholeCon. Uh, the season actually starts for Two Dungeon, our season at Gen Con, um, and uh, that was insane. Eight thousand tickets sold in less than an hour. I mean, it was nuts. Holy uh, shit! That's I know. A lot it's of just. It's, tickets, I, I don't even understand it. It's just. Uh, it's. It's insane. So then the next stop on the season tour is GameholeCon. Now the season this season is. Um, it's a setting we're using Pat Rothfuss's setting. Oh, um, very cool! The Kingmaker yeah. stuff. Yeah. The uh, yep, yep. The King Killer. The King yep, Killer. The, King yep, Killer. Sorry, yep, King Killer. Yep. The the King Killer Chronicles, and uh, so Pat has been intimately involved in the creation of the separate rooms, and we have invested a good deal in this in terms of what the 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 um, the dungeons will look like instead of uh, the. We, it's not pipe and drape. It's sort of a plastic sheeting that goes on on pipe. We are building full on stud walls, uh, and people who play at Gen Con and then at Gamehole Con are going to be in a medieval village. You're going to be able to look into windows of stuff. It's crazy uh, the the what we're doing, and so uh, so it's elaborate. It's set in his in his in his setting, and also a portion of each run goes to his charity. So that's the deal. Oh, his, very cool! We're helping out his charity. He's lending us uh, his IP. Uh, so what's happening then? So you can run it at um, Gen Con, then you come to and run it at Gamehole Con, and they will be different. There will be we'll have new content. 
uh, it'll still be the same setting uh, in these two runs, but we'll have some. Di- well, there'll be different rooms, uh, so those who play at Gen Con obviously can play at Game Con to have a new, different experience. Uh, so, yeah, we're very excited about that, uh, and uh, we're upping the tickets. We're going from 1,200 tickets total last year to 1,500 because it was so well received here. Um, so, yeah, it should be pretty pretty awesome. We're excited about it. Very cool. What else have you got? I mean, you guys always have like you know six thousand special guests because you have no regard. <laughs> as, as I tell people, I said Alex has no regard for his own pocketbook. So, <laughs> apart yeah. from Ed Greenwood and the usual cast of characters, who else have you got? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we we don't make any secret about the fact that we're not trying to make money, and uh, so you're absolutely right. If we break even every year, that's great. So let's see, new guests. Uh, Larry Elmore is coming this year for the first time. Uh, he's a first time guest for us. I'm just going through the list. Zeb Cook is coming back. He hasn't been since year one. I'm excited to see Zeb again. He's such a nice guy. Uh, the author Dave Ewalt is coming this year for the first time. Uh, Jeff Grubb of, of TSR fame is mm-hmm. coming this year for the first time. Um, Pat Kilbane is coming this time. You know, the, the actor from Mad TV. He's a, he's a big gamer, and he's excited to come. Uh, Richard Lanius, who did Arkham Horror and a bunch of other great games, is coming. Uh, his first time. Uh, let's see, new first time guest. We have a, a bunch of. Uh, if you're a D and D AL person, we have a whole bunch of admins who have never been to the show. Uh, most of the admins, in fact, will have almost the entire admin team here. So you can play, um, you know, author only admin goodness uh, and lots of it. Uh, Pat Rothfuss is coming, which I'm excited about. You know, I'm a big fan of his, uh, and I think a lot of a lot of us are. Um, Monica uh, Valatinelli is coming this year, which is great. She's uh, was instrumental in Firefly. Yes. Um, and uh, Steve Winner, uh, another. Uh, TSR alum. He was a uh, editor on some of the editor and author on some of the biggest products that uh, we all love from the uh, mid '80s. So uh, those are the new ones, and then so many returning guests. I mean, that's <laughs> I guess you know it's 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 flattering that people want to come back, you know, and that's I'm, I'm very pleased about that. So the Mark Millers of the world, um, you know, all the old TSR guys. Ed Greenwood's back again. Um, the every, everyone that's normally at our show. So we. Now I'm uh, somewhat sad to report that we're over 40 special guests. It's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, it's a, it's one of those places where I was at um, after I ran into Matt Forbeck and I. Uh, now I've become like a guy who kn- I know Matt Forbeck now and get to hang out with him because I met him at Gamehole Con. I got to BS with him now and I see him at Gary Con and we make plans for, hey, when we come to Gamehole Con, we should do this thing together. So it's it's <laughs> this the the thing about Gamehole Con and having 40 guests is the and. We, we talked about it before on the show. I'm just going to hammer it one more time. It's such an intimate feel is that I've been outside, <coughs> excuse me, a little gaming BS booth, talking to some listeners, just hanging out with people. And then, you know, lo and behold, you know, Ed Greenwood walks by and goes, hey, how's it going? Oh, come on over here, Ed, meet these people, hang out, blah, blah, blah. And he just sits there and, and BSs for like five, ten minutes before he's got to be whisked off to wherever he needs to go or Forbeck stops by or whomever. It's uh-huh. everybody's available. You do a really, really good job making sure the guests aren't just squirreled away in their hotel rooms type of thing. Well, so we awesome. make that very out, very clear. That's the only thing we require is that they be present and uh, they don't you know they don't have to work to death. They don't have to run you know eight games over the weekend, but they've got to run a couple and they've just got to be around. Uh, and you know these people all love what they do and they love interacting with uh, the people who are buying their games and you know the and they're such not, you know they're such nice people. The, I, the, the the entire design team for D and D comes every year because they like the show and they like you guys. They like our they. That's what's so awesome is that I get such compliments about our attendees. Um, that they're everyone's so nice. That they're such good gamers. They run games. Everyone, they 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 have. We seem to have, and it's part of our region. And maybe I don't know. I have, I, I would like to take credit for it, but I think that'd be uh, improper. Um, that uh, the uh, our our attendees are just good gamers. You know, they know the drill. They know how to be polite and how to play. And and uh, and our guests are impressed by that. And that's a you know quite frankly a big part of the reason that they want to come back is because they enjoy interacting with you all. And uh, it's awesome, and it's it's uh, so it's cool, uh, and so then you know it puts us in a position. That I can't really say, I'm sorry, Mike Merles, we just don't have room for you this year. I, yeah. I know yeah, you want to come back. Yeah, 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 exactly. So there. you know, so it's uh, so it's awesome, and uh, well, you know, whatever. We'll just we'll just find a way. So that's why <laughs> we we've done this this uh, created a new badge type uh, called the patron badge. 
and it's a complete donation badge. It's a terrible idea. Um, it's it's <laughs> you just are basically giving us money to help us offset costs. You don't really get anything in return other than the knowledge that you've helped us. Um, you know, I want to be completely upfront about that. It's not worth it unless you care about the show and you want to see great guests. And people have told me they want to buy them. I can't believe it. I thought I just thought, well, what the hell? We'll float it out there. Five hundred bucks gets you a patron badge. There are only ten of them. And you get everything that a VIG badge gets. And the only thing you get in addition is that you get to come to the special guest reception uh, and hobnob with these people on Thursday night. Um, not any real big ba- – I mean, that's cool, sure. But it's not 500 cool. <laughs> um, and But people are uh, – you know, I, I, I am so, I'm so impressed and, and so uh, – and uh, just – uh, enamored with our with our attendees, I, I bet they're going to sell out. I'll bet they'll sell out immediately when when registration opens here later this month on June twenty fourth. Um, you uh, know, I don't so. doubt it. I have found over um, <clears throat> after being to QCC in Buffalo, um, helping run EverCon now, and being involved with GameholeCon, even seeing GaryCon, the number of things people do, even if the convention is a hiccup or if there's a problem, most of the gamers are like, you know what, we're here, we're going to help. What, what can we do? What can we do to help out? Uh-huh. I can almost yeah. guarantee to you if I, if you really needed something, um, I was walking through last year, and uh, Josh is like, "Hey Brett, could you set up some table runners for me?" I'm like, "I didn't sign up to do anything. I could have said no. I'm busy." But I'm like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm gonna do. I'm sure donated a couple hours of my time just to just to do stuff because I love the show, and I can definitely see other people feeling the same way. And if they've got the money to do it, that's a really great way to support you guys. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I feel it's. I. And that's why I'm trying to be as caustic as about as I can because I don't I, I, I it feels graspy to me quite frankly I hate it I wish it uh, um, you know I wish the, the cost of the Alliant Energy Center weren't what they are uh, I wish uh, travel for all these guests were, were cheaper that I could get you know like a, a steerage rate and put them on a boat and have them make a two-week trip across the Atlantic instead of flying them like we do uh, but that's just not the way it is so the, the we have a lot of we have fixed hard costs and when we keep you know the guests keep guests keep uh, list keeps climbing, and we want to do the nice things like, you know, the swag like the level prizes and stuff. That stuff is cool, and we want to keep doing it. It's ex- it's kind of expensive and it's kind of silly, but we like it, and so we're going to keep doing it. And uh, so I don't know. I, and you know, if if in, if zero sell, it's not going to change anything. We'll figure it out, um, and uh, we'll make it we'll make, we'll make it work. It's not we're certainly not in desperate financial straits or anything like that. Unfortunately, we've grown every year and uh, and uh, been able to uh, you know break even. And you even had a couple bucks left over here and there, which we spent immediately uh, on other things. <laughs> um, so uh, no, it's not it's not. She shouldn't certainly shouldn't take it as a sign of uh, financial distress. It's just we're looking at a really big budget this year because we're just doing lots of awesome, and you know we're just, we we took on another twenty five thousand square feet. I mean that's expensive. So, and the, not only that, did we not add on a day? We've got uh, yes. an additional day. We used to be you know it yep. was you show up Thursday, you got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and was a three dayer. <laughs> and now what what have you done? Yeah, we're 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 crawling towards a four day con. Lots of people wanted a four day con, and I, we didn't want to do it until there was really demand for it. And the, it feels like there is. Like we keep getting asked, when are you going to go to four days? So, as a sort of an intermediary step, we're doing a Thursday evening. Uh, so we have a couple slots of games on Thursday night uh, from six to ten, and we're going to see how that goes. And if those pick up well, um, and there are lots of people who want to play on Thursday evening, well, then you know next year we'll go to a full four day. So it's a test. It's a trial balloon, and we're going to see how it goes. Very cool. So if you want four days, people, listeners, show up on Thursday night and show us that you want it. Exactly. And there we will, you go. We will make it so then. Simple, straightforward. Let's get into Random Encounter. Let's do it, man. All right, Random Encounter. I've got a few to read. Uh, Brett, you want to start? Sure, I can start off. Jared Rasher wrote in <clears throat> on the last episode about supernatural horror, kind of keeping it fresh and so forth. And <clears throat> excuse me, he said, while I love all kinds of games and appreciate more narrative games where you don't roll a skill unless there is an interesting consequence, horror and suspense are definitely areas where more traditional skill checks can be used to increase tension. Let's say someone's trying to pick up a key from a sticky, gooey mess. As the GM, you know the goo won't actually hurt the PC if they touch it. However, it's unknown goo. And if you make them roll to see if they can, t- <clears throat> excuse me, to see if they can touch the key without getting any goo on themselves, that creates tension. Even the, the goo isn't going to harm them. Um, if they do end up getting goo on their hand, they're going to be paranoid for a while. So as long as you present the bare minimum of information on the topic, uh, make the check to see if you touch the horrible fluid surrounding the key. <clears throat> it should work. 
This isn't to say that all traditional skill checks are better than more narrative approaches, but more narrative games usually require people to be already be quote unquote in the tropes of, and the style of the game you're playing. If you're trying to inject the feeling into a game without having 100% buy-in, sometimes you can get halfway there just explaining the absolute bare minimum that you need to in order to present the scene in a fair manner. I think that traditional approach can be good for uh, a challenge up tone in games. Trying to have more horror-oriented story arc in the middle of a more traditional fantasy game, for example, might benefit from that approach. Very cool. <clears throat> I like that. I like that, Jared. Good stuff, man. Sean, anything you got on that? No, no. So last episode, um, Alex, we had a super, supernatural horror theme. Mm, okay. So some of the suspense pieces people commenting on. Gotcha. It was kind of the, it was kind of that piece, Alex, where you you like you describe the creature. Someone goes, "Oh, I know that. That's an owl bear. Oh, that's a troll." Someone get the fire out. You know, try. How do you in a, when you know you're playing a supernatural horror game? How do you get people to get into it without metagaming the living hell out of it and still, you know, again, it's that never, ever green uh, topic of how the hell do you scare people when they know you're playing, <laughs> playing a game, right? You know? <clears throat> well, good. it's just the quality of the theater, man. You know, it just is uh, how good of a game master are you at the end of the day, you know, and that's just really what it is. Uh, it comes no, down to it. <laughs> there is there is no silver bullet for it. You know, if there were, we'd be, someone would have bottled them and sold them. Uh, so it's not, it's unfortunately not that simple. It's practice and experience and planning and uh just like anything else that's worth doing you know uh um make you know preparation on the front end yep carlin of the hill people kendrick chimes in as it's often said steal for movies i've stolen liberally liberally from the blair witch project project just to add elements of mystery that can't or won't be explained party takes a rest in the middle of the forest they wake up to stick totems hanging from trees around them Need a little uplift when the party is traveling. They find animals or people ritually gutted and splayed out on the rocks on the border of places they shouldn't enter. Hell, have someone get dragged into the darkness by some unknown beast only to be dropped and left alone. No battle, no fight, just a random event. And how has Brett B. not seen The Thing? He starred in it. (laughs) I have not seen The Thing. It's on my list. I felt bad saying that out loud on the show. Sean brought it up, and I'm like, yeah, I haven't seen the thing. And uh, Sean almost disowned me there, Alex. It was pretty scary. <laughs> <clears throat> Alex, have you seen the thing? Man, I did, but I, I, I can say technically yes, but I don't remember it very well. It's a long, it was long time ago. It was a long sure. time ago, yeah. yeah. I actually, um, what uh, Carlin's talking about there, in my Lamentation of Flame Princess Gamer in this last Friday evening, I did something similar to um, Stick Totems, except it was Bear Traps. Um, so when you have... Um, set bear traps laying around the party when they wake up that really gets them nervous, especially if the first guy almost loses a leg. That really, that really gets them, really gets them worrying. High stepping. All, All right, right. Next, <clears throat> next up, Blake Ryan uh, about supernatural horror. He said you enjoyed your thoughts on this episode, especially the uh, changing NPCs' behavior. Here's a few tricks I use for M- supernatural games involving uh, haunted houses or ruins of the damned. Dum dum dum. <clears throat> None of these things happen consistently, just two to three times per session. More frequently, the closer they get to the scene of the original crime slash most unholy area. Sound distortions. Someone yells or screams in a room. No one else can hear it. Uh, later on, someone hears the noise in another room, possibly repeated three times. It's stuck. Doors and windows jam. DC 30 type to open it. Uh, third time you try it opens easily. The doors and windows also randomly open or shut. Time distortion. Someone is falling or walking downstairs. They spend 10 to 20 seconds doing this. To everyone else, they've been gone for an hour. Feel free to give everyone else a second round of action so the missing player figures out something is not right. Don't sleep. If they rest, be it short or long rest, the monsters respawn in random locations. They're, they're also immune to whatever killed them the last time, be it fire, edged weapons, etc. <clears throat> and the classic, you can't leave. Once you've entered the area, you can't leave. They uh, walk around and find themselves walking back towards the area. There's a life task that must be done in order to break the link to those areas. Those are fun. Ooh. I've Those done are some good ideas. It's a it's classic haunted haunted house stuff where you end up in either it's a haunted grounds, a house, a keep, whatever. You end up in it. You can't leave until you've accomplished the thing, and then the weird, wacky, random, seemingly wacky randomness happens. I also do like picking on one player. You get somebody who's really into it. It's really fun to pick on them then. So like if Alex is super digging on the scene, and like Alex can't open a window, everybody else can open windows, but Alex's character can't. 
And then he starts. To, then the player starts to wonder, like, is it my PC? Is there something about me and Windows? Am I connected to this house in some way? You know, it just it's one more way to up the uh, the paranoia level. It can be fun. <laughs> uh, Chris Shorb, thanks for the link to the forums regarding stamps being worth more marked, while others not so much. So last episode, I mentioned uh, how I was a stamp collector as a young lad, <laughs> but didn't know if they would be worth any, worth a shit. So he, he clarifies that. And who knows? Maybe I'm sitting on like a million bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could you could get into that auction we were talking about off like off hours there. there which, yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll throw in for the patron for the hell of it. Uh, so he also goes on to suggest some show topics, suggestions for player episodes, Paladin slash Jedi, how to play them without being moralistic prigs, uh, hacker slash rigger would like to hear some feedback on non fantasy RPG classes. Uh, and then in- investigator, not instigator, not to be confused with instigator. Same as above. Although I guess in Eberron, you could have fantasy investigators. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks. Chris Shorb. Uh, Brett, you want to take, uh, well, oh, and I'll add because so Stefan Dragonspawn, uh, friend of the show, listener of the show, he, I guess is on a YouTube video actual play where he plays a female elven, elven wizard. So we'll have a link into the show notes if you want to see Stefan in action. I've got to see that one. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't grabbed that yet. All right. <clears throat> Next up is Goblin's Henchman. Um, one of our UK listeners wrote about our Thieves and Rogues episode, and he said some quick comments on episode 140. In AD&D, as thieves leveled up, they gained the ability to read languages, and later the ability to read magical writing, scrolls, for example. Not sure if this really carried over to later editions. It did, Mr. Henchman. Um, generally, under, uh, appreci- generally an underappreciated ability. And I have to say he's right. Back in my day, anyway, when I was a kid playing AD&D, that read languages, read magical writing, was not a thing that... The thieves I played or my friends played did often. It was that that kind of, oh, yeah, shit, I could do that, too. <clears throat> just never really seemed to come up. He also says, I agree thieves should not steal from the group. Bad vibes all around. Uh, but I think a thief should always leave the group with an uneasy feeling they might. Also, if the thief finds the loot first after risking their neck, is it stealing to take a finder's fee before the rest of the group get there? And three, if a player uh, really wants to play the kind of thief that Every player hates the stealing traitorous kind. The D- let, uh, as the DM embrace that, but make it clear that the player is playing an NPC, perhaps in league with the XYZ baddie. Maybe give the player an objective to achieve. Then the player can time their treachery to the utmost. By playing the NPC, the real world bad vibes should be limited, as the player is merely the DM's tool and plot device. If all gets really heated, uh, claim to be playing a doppelganger. Clearly the game should not be repeated. <laughs> that makes sense. Alex, when you you've talked about your group a little bit, the the uh, the game hole guys, or even back in your in your history, have you have you had that problem where you've got the thief or the rogue in the group who insists on stealing from the party and just being a backstabbing fucker? Well, <clears throat> that's funny you ask. I uh, presently I'm playing a rogue right now, and and Josh Hoyt, our, 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 our director of gaming, is running the game, and I am that guy. I'm uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an import exporter, not a thief. I see, um, and um, yes, I uh, I'm <laughs> I, I've built a, a a pretty useless thief in terms of finding traps and all that kind of stuff. But he's really good at picking pockets, uh, and so I'm constantly filching things from the party. Um, and it's everyone thinks it's funny, but sooner or later I'm going to miss the roll, and then it's going to be interesting to see. It's then re- it, then it'll be fun. Um, to see how they handle all that, uh, because you know they all know it, and they just, they just think it's funny. But again, this is a group we play together for you know approaching twenty years now, and so no one takes anything that seriously when it comes to that. I mean, you we we explore. We, we're able to because we're so comfortable and, and uh, such good friends. We're able to explore a little more outlandish. Uh, personalities in the in in the for role playing um you know without worrying about anyone getting offended or upset or anything like that so generally speaking i agree with that the what what your your listener has has, uh, has stated that it's it's not cool to to steal from the party and um you know because it's ultimately it's supposed to be a cooperative game and you're you're running counter to really the thrust of the of the of the mission um but one comment i would like to make that that he he mentioned he talked about read languages 
I actually just played a 1E game a couple days ago. And I, I play a 1E game eh, probably once every couple months. And I am, I'm such a 5E guy now. And I, you know, I played 1E for 30 years or something. So there's just some wonk in that game. And <laughs> the, the read languages is one of them. It's just silly. I mean, are you kidding me? So, and this was a particularly silly example. Uh, we're exploring, we're in a different continent, uh, exploring a tomb and find some ancient writing with a different alphabet. And this guy spikes the 15% read languages. I mean, it doesn't nice. make, how the, how the hell would you be up based on what? I mean, how there's gotta be, you know, that's not how language works. It's not, you just don't intuit it. You have to have something you have to, maybe you have an experience where as a child, you saw that language or uh, the alphabet or something. It just doesn't come from the sky. And it's not like they are, uh, they were, they had, a you know, a, a divinity in, 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 not with a thief. I no, mean, okay, come on now. Come on now, Alex. Can you, Make- form and hieroglyphics are the same thing as the Indo-European alphabet. It's totally fine. <laughs> Jeez, it's like man, it's great. I mean, it helped us, but it's like that should not be. It's it, there has to be some when when it is just a a, a, a rote rule like that and and not circumstantial. Um, and that's the problem with rules uh, is that uh, you, you get odd results like that. That there's just no way in any sort of logical you know think of reality way that could ever happen. Uh, and that, you know, and I get that. You know, hey, we're playing fantasy games, but again, we we if it's if it's a if it's a cleric communing with their god and they get something, okay, that's a trope, and that's a that's at least a thing. I I can see that you can make that happen, or um, whatever, or some 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 magic route, but not just from you're a thief, and because you're a thief, you are able to, you know, it, it, once in a while. Um, you know, grab and and understand some language you would have absolutely no basis for understanding whatsoever. I, I whatever. So anyway, rant over. It was just one of those things that just happened on Thursday night, and I, I thought, <laughs> and I wasn't running the game. I was playing it. I was playing a paladin, and it was Steve Winter had to deal with it. He was the extra guy running the game, and uh, <laughs> that's funny. He looked, he said, you made you made the roll, and so it kind of screwed him up actually, because he you know it was a it was a, because once you had that, you could avoid a bunch of traps he had set, and. Uh, um, of yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes when you play. That's when you have one e rules, man. Stuff like that happens. That's funny. That is awesome. Yeah. All right. Shall we get into it? Yeah. Let's get into the main topic. Let's do it. All right. Main topic for the evening, Brett. Yes. I want to talk to Alex about the kids track. One of the things that GameWorkCon is doing this year is they're putting together a track of gaming for kids. And I don't know if it's all RPGs. We've got board games, card games. We don't know a lot of details about it. So I figured, you know what? We're going to pick Alex's brain. Um, One, I'm selfish. I'm a dad. I've got Five kids of my own. Half of them like to play. <clears throat> Actually, they all cornered me now that school is over, and the, and they said, "So we're going to run a summer D and D campaign, right?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I guess, guess we were making characters." <laughs> so, so there's a summer D and D campaign going at my house this year. Um, but Sean and email I email us both- at email us at gamingnbs at gmail dot com if you would like to participate. Oh, stop, stop. <laughs> in Brett's summer game. Yeah, it's Brett's running a summer camp. Send your kids over. Camp. It's room oh, and board wow. included. Room oh. and board included. He's in you know Richland what? Center. I've got, uh, I, you know, with the number of kids I have, if, if I have one or two more, I might not notice. So there's a fair chance you could probably slip a couple into the house. And we'd be so busy with the new dog, I wouldn't even notice the kid. So anyhow... Alex, um, what the hell made you want to do this? I mean, I know you've got two kids, and they're they're much. Um, when I say much younger, they're not what I would normally say. I, my assumption, anyway, Alex, is that you're not running D and D for your for your two at this point. Is that true? That's true. That's true. Um, well, I have a currently a nine year old and a five year old. Uh, we play a lot of No Thank You Evil. We we've actually literally worn out a dungeon set, the board game. Oh, that's uh, awesome. And uh, we, uh, my kids, so they they love gaming. And so actually this, I think uh, this week I'm in my little guy's 4K class uh, and I'm going in and uh, they have center time and they they circle through centers and I'm running one of the centers and I'll have a gaming center and they're they're there for about five minutes, which is about all they can handle, um, you know, on one topic. And uh, so they each get a D20 and a miniature and I put them through a little cooperative scenario, each group as they rotate through and they love it. Um, So it's that experience. And also, uh, because I have kids of the age that I do, uh, and all the other game hole guys, almost all of them have kids, you know, that ranging from, um, I think my guy at five is probably the youngest, and then, you know, through your kid's age, um, we, you know, we're gamers with kids. And uh, so Josh and I, for years, have been running a kid's game at 
game hole con here or there, you know, so I'd run one su- Sunday morning. It would always sell out really fast. And I, uh, uh, would, and so the parents would come and they would sit behind their kids and I'd play, you know, um, last year was no thank you evil and it was fun and they were very appreciative. Uh, and I, you know, started thinking about it, thought, man, there's probably a lot of us who are this age who have kids and would like to have their, 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 their children have an opportunity to not to play with someone other than just dad or mom. Um, and so I was actually Rachel Ventura of uh, Legendary Games, who's got a couple of uh, very uh, lovely girls. And she, uh, I was talking to her about it. She said, you know, let's do it and I'll help organize. And I said, well, that's great. If you're willing to, t- to help with it, then, then absolutely. So she's done a great job of coming up with sponsors. So if you go to the Game Holcon page and you click on the kids track link you'll see all these sponsors and what's important about that is that they're donating a shitload of stuff so the kids who play in our kids track are getting this awesome swag bag like for example the, the we have 50 bags each one's going to contain a D starter set you know and stuff like that we're not talking like wow. some, like a, a, a pen or a piece of gum or some crap like that like real stuff like valuable stuff they're getting better swag than any of our attendees are getting uh because you know, everyone loves kids. Everyone loves the idea of kids getting into gaming. Monty Cook Games sent a couple boxes. Gaming Paper did. Uh, you know, I mentioned Wizards, Reapers sending a bunch of miniatures. I mean, it's fabulous. So, um, so the the but the structure of it is it's for ages four through twelve, and what we're doing is that we're you know we're still we're still the just like you guys are submitting games. Uh, and running them that's you know we're not running games you guys are and your listeners are running games for us same with the kids track what we're doing is that if you want to run in the kids track you have to apply and you uh, we ha- we set up an application form and basically it just gives us a little bit about your background what's your experience running games um, and will you consent to a background check um, which is important and so we do at, you know it's not like you know uh, um, uh, applying for a government job kind of background check. It's, uh, but it is. We at least check because well, I think I, as a parent, um, want to know that uh, the person that is um, that is running games for kids doesn't. There's not some obvious problem with that, and so we're trying to take care of that. So they're vetted GMs. So once you apply, uh, we do a quick vet, and then we approve the application. Then you can submit games for the kids track just as you would for any other game and it gets gets slotted in a specific area. That'll be the kids area. What this is not is daycare though. Uh, I was just going to ask you that because I mean my, my first thought was holy shit you're going to end up with a bunch of people that like dump the kid and then go run off to play in their Adventures League game and then you're going to have like six screaming eight-year-olds. No, there has to be an adult, and it can be one adult for several kids that, you know, okay. they know, you know, that's fine. It's not like one on one, but, you know, they, they still are kids' policies, which are, you know, have been consistent since our first show, are still in place. And that is that kids under a certain age have to be accompanied by an adult. And that's, that, that, that is, um, th- that still goes in the kids' track area. We are going to have a full time volunteer, someone there, monitoring things. But again, this is not, you know, a playground monitor. This is not a rompus room monitor. This is someone just to, just to make sure that everything's okay, um, just a, a little added uh, oversight. But again, it's not not daycare. So I, I want to make that clear that if you have your kids, and, I, and gosh, I hope you, your listeners who have, who have kids get them involved and, and first of all take advantage of this unbelievable swag and some great games, um, opportunities to play in some tremendous games. Um, that they understand that they you know they can't just drop them off and pick them up in the evening. That's not that's not the way. So is the um, if I'm so if I'm there and I. One of my kids is able to make it, and they say, "Okay, I want a game." Um, my kid wants a game. Am I gaming with my child in the kids' game, or am I on the sideline watching my child game? How how okay. how are you seeing this happen? Yeah, it, well, for there are there's some of each. There okay. are four through twelve. So for the kids that are you know four, five, six, seven, those are going to be you know you're playing dungeon or something like that. That is going to be playing with other kids. That's not a, the parents. You, uh, you know, wh- I guess the the answer is however the person who runs the game submits it. So oh, okay, they, that makes sense. So if they want to run a game where parents, kids and parents play together, great. If they want just kids, that is. So the, again, it's not we're not saying what this has to look like. We're just saying the age limits, the age ranges are X, 4 through 12. Anything that fits in that range and uh go for it, you know. Um so I, I guess I don't know because we haven't we're still taking games and we actually I'd love to see some more um get submitted. Um so we can, uh, because I, you know, we have a couple, but we still don't have anywhere near a full, full schedule, and that's typical. I and mean, we're just getting started with our games. Really, we only have, 
Yeah, we probably have 500 total events so far. So that's probably you know that's not even we're not even to the you know we're probably about a third of our total events so far. Um, is this going to be um, all? Is this going to be like all Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Are you looking to fill mm-hmm. the, the entire? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. We'd like to. We'd like to. I mean, there'll probably mm-hmm. be gaps, but you know, it'd be nice to have a kids game going all the time, um, because. Well, just because there, you know, you guys have been to our show since the beginning, and I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we have a very f- uh, family-friendly show. We see a lot of kids at our show. We see a lot of women at our show. Uh, quite frankly, we have more women at our show than any other convention I've ever been to. Um, and I don't know if that's a, I, I'm, I'm not sure why that is. I hope it has something to do with us. Um, but uh, so it's uh, so to have the the opportunity for families to. Uh, that our gamers that want to have their 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 little boy or little girl play in a real con game, uh, you know, sitting at a table with their with their like age kids and play, you know, that's I, I I'm excited for my kids to be able to do that. I think it's going to be great. Hmm. Okay. Very cool. So, so I like that. I don't know. You know, this is we're taking a stab at it, and the, the reception has been overwhelmingly positive. I mean, I, again, from the the sponsorship stuff was crazy. I was not expecting that. <clears> that. Um, that uh, the, uh, the gaming industry would be so interested in this, and it makes sense that they are. But I guess I didn't really expect that. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that we get more events, and uh, we've gotten. I've you know we've approved a bunch of uh, kids track GM applications already. Uh, so people have applied, and that's great. And I hope there are more. And I hope we get lots of kick-ass events. And you know, let's let's uh, let's do things for kids that was not done for us. You know, uh, we had to find these hobbies on our own. You know, and and sometimes under difficult circumstances, this is going to be a way where you have an opportunity to play a, a vetted game, a fun game that's designed for you, that that child, and have an, you know is close to a guarantee of having an awesome time and have a great impression of gaming and hopefully then something like they can launching a, 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 an interest or a hobby for these kids that they can always have. Um, and I'm, you know, I certainly am interested in that for my kids because I think gaming is wonderful and I hope, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, a lot of other gaming parents feel the same way. So when we talk, you talk about like vetting the people and I think that's obviously in a large, in a public area with a convention and you, you need to do that. You don't necessarily need the full rubber glove treatment, but we have to do at least the cursory, you know, within reasonable, um, means to, to make sure things are up on the up and up, which totally makes sense. Are there any other challenges that you've encountered so far with it? I mean, um, was it like, oh shit, we have to carve out a whole a whole chunk of the convention for this space? Is it do you have a dedicated space problem? Even something as is um, as wacky as food or anything along those lines? Are you do you need do you need rooms for naps? I mean, do we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, if, if there's yeah, I could use one myself, but. The- no, the the uh, the space issue is that's that you know that's solvable, and um, that's why we, we just took on we always just take on more space. So that's what we did. Uh, so we will have a dedicated area, so they everyone knows where it's going to be, and so they can if they if they have kids that are going to play you know multiple events, it's always going to be in the same general area. Okay, that's um, good. So if I yeah. do if I do go and I've got my my horde with me, and like oh we're going to play all their stuff is happening in the same area, not mm-hmm. having to run around the whole place. Got it. No, you're not looking for a table X and hall whatever. It's going to be in you know those we have de- dedicated spots. And in fact, that's sort of a trend that we're going to more and more. Uh, and quite frankly, in, in part, in, in large part, due to you guys. I mean, you were one of the first groups who said, "Hey, can we have a gaming and BS area?" Well, if you can fill it with games, absolutely. Because I mean, that's well, Brett, you run a show yourself. You know yep. that if you have someone who's going to take a table and fill it with games the entire time, that's that's really easy from a uh, space planning, space allocation standpoint. It's done, and you don't have to try to worry about conflicting events and t- when the game stops and starts and get another game on that same table. That takes it away. So there are a lot of companies that this year, um, uh, like Frog God Games um, uh, and several others who are going to have dedicated areas where they're going to run all their stuff on, and that's great for us and it's great for them. So this sort of fits hand in glove with that. This is another sort of spot where you'll have consistent one type of game again, kids' games in this area. Um, so, and you're yeah. you're anticipating um, board games, like you said, like Dungeon and RPGs. No, thank you, Evil D and D. Again, whatever somebody throws in. Yeah. Are there? Um, are you? Yeah. How do I, I have, you probably haven't had anything come in quite yet from a games perspective, or if it has, you may not have seen it. But is are we hoping for more RPG stuff, or is what's your? I guess is there a vision that you have in your head, like, hey, everyone's playing D and D, or No, thank you, Evil, some variant, or do you? Is as long as our gaming is good enough. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to see a variety. I hope they'll, you know, stuff like Tiny Dungeon. Um, I would like to see, I mean, there's so many great board games that are for kids that I have, you know, I've got stacks of them here <laughs> uh, for my guys that I hope we'll see some of those. Um, like Hirelings, I think this is a, I mean, I ran that two years ago at Game of Con. The kids loved it. It's a great game for kids that are, uh, you know, in that six to eight range. Uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, just a variety. Uh, and so the kids that, can can you know splash around all this kind of stuff and find out what kind of game they like. Um, no, I'm, we certainly don't have any mandate. It has to. It should be this kind of game. No, nothing like that. Uh, I hope it's you know or or card games or miniature games. I mean, um, uh, we're going to do uh, God, what's Chris Clark's game? The uh, Fuzzy Heroes, I think. We're oh, okay, about. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's going to be one, for example, which is kind of a miniatures game, and you know because you know kids like to play with stuff, and so miniatures games are awesome for 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 the Munchkins. So I mean, I uh, you know the and the more you know, proppy and goofy and silly and fun. Of course, I mean, the kids love stuff like that. You know, what's great, you know, what I find so so inspiring and so fun about playing with kids, you don't have to, you don't have to start with, if you, like, picture a, a, an adult who's never game and you bring him into a game and you have to explain, okay, well, this is a fantasy setting, so think of the Lord of the Rings and there are things like elves and magic and you just have to accept that that's reality here. No, these guys have that stuff preloaded in their brains right now. They're thinking about that shit all the time. They, yeah, exactly. Princesses, princesses are real. Fairies are real. Elves are real. <laughs> this wand does things. I mean, they. So the 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 immersive part of it is already done. All you got to do is tell them a story and guide them, and and so it's they're they're wonderful, instinctive, natural fantasy gamers. So. Uh, um, you know that's why I enjoy it so much, and that's why I volunteer to do it. I run a lot of it at different shows and stuff because it's so fun. They so when, just crazy. So when you are running games for kids, this, I mean exactly what you just said is like at my son's birthday party. Um, AJ said I want to play D and D. It's okay, so I kind of stripped it down to its <clears throat> simplest version of it, just hand out some very basic spell stuff and whatever. And the all his buddies were like totally into it. There was no okay. Make sure your half work behaves. You know this is how it works in the world. And boom, kids in it. I mean, Danny's like just playing. This other guy is this. They got a kick out of the fact that the biggest kid was playing the halfling because he really like wanted to be a halfling. So <clears throat> they're already in it. So as soon as you throw a character at them, they're like, okay, what do I? What does this guy do? Oh, um, she's like the you know warrior princess with a cybernetic arm. I got that. You know they're they're off and running. It doesn't take a lot. But when you go to yeah. set up a game for kids at a con, it's different for me when I've done. I've not done it at a con for kids. I mean, I've run some stuff for the Everest Gaming Club and, and so on, but it's been very controlled. When you're going for a con and you're going to set up a game for kids, you mentioned the goofy, the fun, and so on. Is there a level of I don't want to go too far. Um, I don't want to be too silly that it's just slapstick stupidity. Um, you know, I don't want to end up in, a, in the potty humor thing. I also don't want to be so serious and dark. I mean, I don't want, you know, murdered dogs and dead babies as a horror. I mean, there's our kids. You know, we need to keep it at a certain level. Do you have, like, a go-to game system if you were to say, hey, I want to run an RPG for these kids? I think I would prefer – it's going to be kids at Game Hole. Brett, you should run something that looks like this. Do you have an ad- example or an idea? Well, um, so if you if you look at our application, we ask specifically what games have you run for kids, um, so we have an idea. So that that sort of sorts that out, you know. So we know that oh yes, that makes total sense that they ran that. Um, but if it's something, that, no, the answer is no. I've never run games for kids. I'd like to. What do you suggest? You know, the games we've been talking about, gosh, it's really, I, you know, I keep beating this drum, but I think No Thank You Evil is an awesome game for kids. It's so, so freeform and fun and cooperative and it rewards, uh, it war- rewards cooperative play and it's positive and it's easy and intuitive. Um, so I think that's a great game. Um, but, you know, w- you know, the, 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 the back to that, the, the sort of the thruster theme about how kids play. You don't have some asshole like me saying, "Oh, a thief shouldn't be able to read that language." Right? <laughs> exactly. They don't know. That's, they say, that's why, not why realistic. Couldn't that language? Why couldn't they read that language? You know, because they just they don't they don't they don't they don't. Fortunately, they're not uh, they're not jaded and mean and, and and a dick like me. Uh, they they're 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 full of wonder and uh and they're just they're open to all that kind of stuff. So as long as and you know especially I think the more, probably the most important question that we have is, are you a parent? So if you're a parent, um you're going to know you're going to understand you know 
if you start talking about poop, it's going to descend into madness. You know, yes. just don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you don't don't you know? bring up don't mention that there's a you know the goblin is peeing. Don't mention yeah. that. that oh, goes man, badly you, you fast. Have half an hour to get that thing back on the rails. You know, and uh, <laughs> and also as a parent, you're going to know how. To, there's always just like every game table. There's always going to be one at every table who's going to want to be the main thing and you know want to talk all the time. And it's you know you have to be experienced. In, with dealing with kids and say, "Hey, little Billy, that, that's great, but we're going to go around the table, and everyone's going to get their oar in the water here. Everyone's going to be able to speak, and everyone's going to get a turn because that's that's what we do. And you know, you got to be comfortable enough with your own, I guess, uh, kid relationship, parenting abilities to say that to someone else's child, uh, or else some kid, in a, you know, fortunately, usually there's a parent there and say, "Hey, little Billy, you're being, you know, just calm down, you know." But that sometimes won't happen. And sometimes people, I mean, I've had that where I've seen, you know, a kid being pretty, pretty aggressive and wanting to, you know, throw the dice across the table and run, really want to be in there and sort of be a one on one game, excluding five others, where I've had to, you know, uh, just, you know, talk calmly and sort of sort them out and say, hey, you know, let everyone go and we'll, we'll, we'll start at the other end of the table and we'll work our way towards you and things like that. I mean, uh, that's why experiences, we're looking for people who's, who've run games for at least their kids before. This, you know, if you've done that, then you know how to do it. That's a good point because I mean, I, I as apart from running games for kids, I teach uh, martial arts for kids. I've done yeah. that for a long time, and there's a certain point you you've got some kids that are overly aggressive, some are really shy, some are incredibly talented. They're really really good at a thing. I mean, if you've got a kid in basketball, soccer, any sport, you you've got that one kid who's just an absolute dynamo, but is super quiet, not very you know very unassuming. You, all the different stereotypes of kids are out there, and um, there is a level of comfort that I think I think you're dead right. You've got to be able to say, hey, you know. You know, Mary, just hang on a second. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I, I know it's important. Just give me a second because Tom's talking. All right, Tom, yeah. you're done. Good. Now, Mary, it's your turn. Yeah. And, and you uh, know, so Brett, ro- submit a game, please. You'd be great. I hope <laughs> you do because you'd be great at this. And now I'm going to have to now. I got to do yep, it. Yep. Yep. You've, you've already you've, you've you've trotted out your credentials, so now it's time to to sign on the dotted line. All right. <laughs> you got me there. So, Sean, you yeah. were talking about running um, games and stuff for for kids or thinking about getting kids involved in it. Do you have any? Thoughts or questions on this stuff, Sean? Yeah, you know, it's uh, my the age group I'd be looking for is probably a little bit older, probably the teens, which is the thing that I brought up before is kind of, you know, some of the teenagers in my neighborhood probably don't have access to this stuff. Uh And they're probably getting into stuff that, you know, you know, kids get bored. And when they get bored, they, they do things that may not be very constructive. And so one of the things I had thought about was, um, and I mentioned it on the show before, um, and I, and I mentioned it to a co- one other individual, um, by the name of Ephraim, who, who's actually done this on the north side of Madison. And, uh, you know, he's given me some things to think about. And, um, he, his approach was more of the board games. So he got some pretty decent people to donate board games and he started running small events at the north side library here in Madison. And it started out as, yeah, it's great. It's, you know, it keeps them busy. It's, it's a good thing. And it was all positive uh, until it wasn't and by the staff, which kind of soured me. So one of the things I wasn't considering was, was board games. It was more role playing games. And then, of course, there was some feedback on, you know, what, what system to use and, uh, how do you keep them engaged and, and even just try to, I don't know, I guess for lack of better words, lure and attract them into the, to the format of an RPG that they may not have any interest in, right? It's, you know, some kids like, ah, it's dumb, that's stupid. And maybe there's even a stigma to it because they might know a little bit about it from some of the people they play or they go to school with. I don't know. But, uh, I would probably be targeting something around the, Oh, I don't know, 12 to 15 or 12 to 14 years old, you know, junior high limits and, and that respect. So, yeah. Any advice that would be, I know, um, shoot somebody online, let us know, Brett, that they were doing that for a school, um, like a, a RPG club. And I'm sorry, I forgot their name or who was doing it. it it's interesting. Cause the, uh, the reason I got involved in Evercon was cause the DC Evers gaming group, but the uh, high school I graduated from, they started of course, long after I graduated, but, uh, Christian, I'm an, <coughs> excuse me, the teacher there started, he's a hardcore Gamer and uh, AD and D second edition is his is his bag man. He, uh, he he runs a mean game of that and he's really really good. I loves it. Um, and I've been to a number of their different things running for that kind of younger and uh, junior highish 
type of age group that he'll get. And there are some there are some kids in there that are really smart, really good, and they you know you will get children in these types of things that you know somebody has a a pretty fucked up family life, which is really hard because you can you can see the kids struggling and and trying, and it's it's uh <clears throat> it's a different dynamic right than coming to a gaming convention where hopefully um the well, the parents that are bringing them there are are interested in at least having their kid exposed to this thing right you uh, hopefully alex doesn't have you know a horde of you know obnoxious angry parents glaring in the corner wishing it was over so they could take their kid somewhere else which i'm i'm assuming that won't happen because it's just not how game hole con i mean if you go there that's you you're there to game gamer parents are going to bring gamer kids is how i see it but uh yeah i think <clears throat> i think once you get I think the group that you're looking at, Alex, is actually a really good sweet spot to get kids engaged <clears throat> early enough that they can they can play. Even if their parents aren't hardcore gamers, they can come, they can play, and they haven't. <laughs> once you hit that junior high uh, age, then the jadedness starts <laughs> can set in. Sometimes it can get a little bit harder. So I think the group you've got is a little bit not not necessarily easier to run for, but easier to get accepted by. I think. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, so, but to loop back, I think Sean, the for that for that age group, fifth edition D and D man. I mean, that's the, yeah. because you could put together kick ass characters, and you know, once you so you're, you're you know you're the the powerful spellcaster, you're the the big barbarian with an axe, and sort of that sort of a little more munchkin-y kind of style of game p- gameplay um you know that's less role play interested and more uh, you know combat oriented which kids that age are like most likely to be you know, fifth edition uh, accommodates that very well in a very user friendly way so that's if i were going to do that that's what i would do uh, for for kids that age um, and that's what you see at adventure league i mean they can easily jump into adventure league games and in fact uh, you know i I've, I've been in a lot of tables in different conventions at playing al with kids that age um i think it's uh it, there it's a it's a great kind of game for them because it's uh short they're one shots um and they tend to be you know max min max kind of character kind of stuff um which is again not the way i like to play normally but uh uh for kids that age i think they they, they dig it um and then as far as the younger kids, yeah, geez, they're they're open to just about anything. They just want if someone's confident and will tell them a story and 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 guide them through something that sounds cool and fun, um, you know, <laughs> they'll they'll be good gamers and they'll be they'll they'll uh, they will respond to it and uh you know, I've run I don't know how many kids tables. I've never had a bad one where I said, "Geez, that sucked. I don't want to do that again." I ever it's been fun every time there've been something always really really fun happens you know um and uh the and the kids seem to have a great time so i i think it's been i found it to be tremendously rewarding so alex apart from some of the folks who have already signed up and i got to get my application in obviously so i can go through the process but apart from the the folks like me and and maybe Sean if we can get him to do it other people there want to do it have you once you announced this coming out there what kind of did you get any feedback from like the gaming community at large from other conventions you've gone to or you were just at North Texas. I mean, not that everybody knows what all the ins and outs of game will come, but are you getting feedback? Yeah, the, the, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive to one that we're doing it, and two that we are conscientious about the way we're doing it, meaning that we're we're, we're there's a vetting process. Um, and you know, it's been when we announced on Facebook, there's been a lot of very sweet things like thanks for looking out for our kids kind of stuff, and you know, very very positive and and thoughtful and nice things that have been. Um, that have been very that, that that have been said that are that mean a lot. So, I think we're on the right track. Uh, I think this is we're we're you know we'll see how it goes. I am expecting it to go really well, but I expect everything to go really well. Um, but I don't think this will be any different. I do not think this will disappoint. Um, and we're going to do our best to see that it's fun. Um, the fact that the kids get so much stuff <laughs> in of itself, um, you know. Is uh, you know, kind of a, a Christmas morning kind of experience. Uh, <laughs> That's very true. I mean, very few things make a bunch of little kids happier than. Free yeah, stuff. I don't think there's going to be a single kid walking out of there with a huge bag full of stuff and say, "Oh, what a bummer, mom!" You know, that's <laughs> not going to happen. You know, yeah, so, if, if uh, only I had gotten better free stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited about it. I'm really excited about it. I'm excited for my kids to be able to play in it too. I'm, I'm gonna, and I'm, I, I'm still thinking through. I probably run a No Thank You Evil game because I just love that game. Um, 
but uh, yeah, it's it's. I'm excited about it, and I think it's going to be a, a nice addition to our show because it fits with our show. You know, you wouldn't do it at North Texas because that's a very much a grognardy. Uh, it's a great con, one of my favorite cons. I love going there, but it just there are no kids there. It's just not designed for that. It's for you know the the you know if you're in your 30s, you're the kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a know, good point. So. That is a good point. At, at 44, I am one of the younger guys at those type of conventions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I don't have that much gray hair. So, but, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, we have a, we have, you know, a, a broader demographic. So I think it's, I think it's going to work. And, uh, but then again, I think everything's going to work. So we'll see. Well, cool. Sean, you have any more questions? I do not. As always, Alex well, covered all the good points. So it's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Blather, blather, blather. So, but the the you this I think you mentioned that this this episode is going to drop uh, later in the month, uh, and that's that's timely because registration opens on June twenty fourth. Uh, and if for a listener out there, if you had a VIG badge, you should have renewed it by now. Uh, as you're listening to this, and if you haven't, you you're probably going to have a handful of days to renew it because if you don't renew it, that VIG badge goes back into general population that is able to be purchased by anyone on June 24th at noon. The uh, we'll, we'll be issuing some new VIG badges, but probably in the order of 25. Uh, so those will go immediately. I mean, they will literally go in under five minutes. All the outstanding VIG badges will be sold. I'm always amazed that that happens, but that's going to happen again. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not amazed because it's a, it's the fact that you get uh, early event registration is a big deal. I would, that's something I would do. That's why we did it because I would, I would want that. <laughs> yeah. Would, oh, absolutely. To, uh, to get, to be able to have a chance to not have to go through the crush of, uh, of thousands of people registering and have just a couple of hundred people with you registering with, when you have thousands of events to pick from, you're going to get the games you want. That's what it's basically guarantees you get the games you want. Um, so again, for those folks out there who do have a VIG badge, um, hopefully you've already taken care of it. If not, please do so immediately or else it goes into the general pool. And then on June 24th at noon, that's when the gun fires and, uh, you know, we'll see, you know, what, uh, how, you know, what, how, how we start with badges this year. I was, um, yeah, you know, it's an exciting time for us. So one last question I have, you just, you mentioned badges that brought it back to my mind was <clears throat> for parents who are coming with their kids, um, is, is, are there, I'm, it's on the website, I know, but kids, ba- kids badges are they same as adult badges? Is there a different? Co- is there a cost differential? What if I just want to sit with my kid? I want to be a spectator. You know, when those questions pop up, what's what's the answer? Yes, no, that's good. I'm and I'm glad I've had this page open so I can click on the kids policies link here and uh, because I you know so yes, well, there is a there's a whole page on on um, uh, on policies on, uh, on attendance policies and there's a whole kids page about it. So uh, kids eight and under are free. Um, and oh, so this is a nice feature. So this has been a challenge, and and I think uh, Brett, you'd sympathize with this having to having run a show. Um, what do you do t- for, for example, a free badge when you register yourself? How do you get a badge for you know your your child um, because they don't have an account? Yeah. Um, you you what what are you gonna do? Have them buy a badge and then refund it. I mean, that's, that's awkward and dumb. Yes. Um, so what we now have done is create a, uh, you, you have a family account you can create. It's basically everyone has the ability to add sub accounts to their account that don't require an actual account. So you don't have to have a new email address. So you, Brett, can now register all your children under your own, co- under your own, uh, account and their names show up on their badges. And if they're eight and under, they're free. Um, uh, 12 and under just have to have to uh, buy have to have a you know eight, eight, uh, nine and over have to have a badge 12 and under have to be accompanied by an adult um, and 13 and over are just you know they're at, they're free to do whatever they do at that point they're old enough to uh, you know kind of go on their own if they they want where we feel comfortable about enough at that age that they can roam anywhere in our show and they'll be fine so in a nutshell that's the those are the kids' policies, but that's that's. An, I'm glad you actually mentioned that because that's a nice feature. Um, and we also have a, a system now that you can friend, like you and Sean can friend each other, and you can buy game tickets for Sean, or vice versa. Oh, nice! And that's a nice thing because you know a lot of people. You know that's how we are the game hall when we go to different shows. We want to play together, and so it's a pain in the ass if we all have to sit there and you know at the when the gun fires that we're all clicking on the same game. We hope we get tickets as opposed to you can say, "Hey, I'll get the I'll get tickets for everyone, put them in our wish list, and get them." 
And uh, so that's that's going to make, uh, especially for things like True Dungeon, where it's it's quite frankly more fun to do it with friends. Um, so you can you can buy tickets for other people, uh, and they sp- they go directly to that person's account. Um, so yeah, I think we've done some things to make it e- hopefully easier. Well, I know we have. These are going to be easy. These are nice improvements that'll make it easier for uh, uh, for families and for friends to uh, sort each other out with uh, things like uh, uh, playing together. Very cool. Very very cool. Good. Yeah. That was the last question I had. Yeah, let's hit uh, let's hit die roll. Let's do it. All right. Shortlist this week, Brett. Kick it off. Yes. Uh oh. Uh, I lost my connection on Zencaster here, dude. So hopefully, oh, they're reconnected. All right. Hopefully, I didn't lose anything. Anyway, there we go. So shortlist. Um. So apparently, human flesh cures diabetes and depression, according to some Florida cannibals that were arrested not that long ago. So link in the show notes. This is um, one of those <laughs> one of those things you probably should not bring to your game hole con kids game, the uh, Florida Cannibals game. Not a good idea. But if you're running a Delta Green game or something along those lines, this could be handy. So anyway, link in the show notes. That little tidbit of a story. This, I think it's some uh, sort of bizarre homeopathic thing, Alex. I'm, I'm sure there's a good there's good science behind it. I'm I'm positive it's right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, I think that's further. We'll put that under the faith healing category. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you believe it to be so, it is so. Okay, cool. All right, so head over to Kickstarter and support Todd Crapper's game High Plain Samurai. Uh, Todd supports the show. He is uh, 23 days left. Um, from the day this show dropped, uh, already met his funding goal of twenty two twenty four. It's got to be a, some weird number. It's got to be a reason for it. Yeah, uh, you can hear him talk about the game on the Gauntlet podcast, and I'll put a link in the show notes so you can go over to the Gauntlet and listen to how he explains a little bit of the show um, with the host of the Gauntlet and learn a little bit more about the Kickstarter, but. Since he's uh, supporting the show, we certainly want to throw him some support as well. He was also on um, Mr. Director Mark had him on. Um, shit, I'll get a link in the show notes to the specific episode as well. But he was out there uh, as well talking to Chris and Phil and uh, Bob, and it was a pretty good episode as well. So another good place to get some more goodness from Todd's game and what he's up to. Yeah. Uh, last one uh, from Shane Freeman. So he, a little inspiration for your espionage game, wartime spies who use knitting as an espionage tool. I would have never guessed. Yeah, I saw that. And I, I, I've got it like stuck in the bookmarks to read because I'm like, how the hell did they do that? I have no idea. Spies, man. Damn spies. Well, I would certainly, this would be as a part of the show where I'd pimp the, ma- the mighty game hole con. And tell people to go to gameholecon.com. But if you haven't gathered that from the the earlier parts of this show, you should go over there and get your ass to gameholecon. It's the first weekend of November. It's going to be crazy, fun. Alex has got all kinds of stuff going on. It's going to be good. I've never, I have, this is my favorite, this is my favorite gaming convention. I, when I've gone, and that's not just because Alex is on the show and he's a good dude, but I mean, after I went to, I missed Game Hole 1, but I went to Game Hole 2, and uh, I'll be damned if I'm ever going to miss it again. It's it's my favorite show. It's really, really good. I appreciate that, guys. That's very nice of you to say. Um, and you guys have been such great supporters, so, and uh, and that's what's so cool about it. They're, you know, the people take um, uh, ownership of it, and they feel feel strongly about it, so it's been, it's been a fun thing to be part of. Now, just I now on a side note, Alex, something to be aware of. Now, I had heard the UK Games Expo was this past weekend. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of that. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. So I asked one of the folks that I follow and, and tied to on uh, Facebook. I said, "Yeah, what is the attendance of UK Game Expo?" And they they kind of spelled it out. They said, "Yeah, you know, the first few years it was this, and then you know by this year." It went to like five thousand, and now it's up to like something like fifteen thousand. Huh. So, so apparently, in the last, I think maybe two, he obviously explained a very steep curve up at a particular junction. Do you anticipate that from Game Hole? Like, you think like first few years now, you know, hovering around a few thousand, and then all of a sudden it's going to be like it's just going to explode? Well, I don't think so because we've had 
just about 40% growth every year. And so when you start to get into thousands, 40% is a big number. Yeah. So that's why, you know, we're going to go from, uh, we went from, uh, you know, f- geez, it was like 1,400, 2,400 last year. We'll go, we're going to jump to over 3,000 this year, I'm sure. Um, so it's going to feel like an explosion, but actually it's going to really, f- I think it's going to follow that curve pretty nicely. I, I uh, it, it could, it could happen, I guess. And, and God, I hope it doesn't quite frankly. I mean, it's it, growth is great. Um, uh, but it, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we have enough games and we have enough food trucks and we have enough, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, um, um, but, uh, you know, and then, you know, I, the thought of running a 15,000 person show, my God, I just, you know, <laughs> I, you know, we don't, we don't do this for a living. You know, this is not our job. These are, we're just doing, we're, we're essentially glorified volunteers. You know, I had um, 1100, I had 1100 people at Evercon and that's not nearly as complicated as game hole. And I was pulling my hair out. Yeah, I, I could not 15,000. I'd be like, no, somebody buy this convention from me. I quit. Yeah. I yeah. Like, well, that's why, that's why they it. get, that's why at that size, they get awfully, awfully corporate because that's really the only way you can do it. You know, you can't yeah. do, you can't do the sort of goofy stuff that we do. Um, for that many people and still have it be, be good, you know, and that's, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to, you know, there are already good corporate shows out there, you know, they're, we don't, you don't need another one. Um, so, so I don't know. That's an interesting question. And, uh, I don't know. Hopefully it, uh, is put off for a few more years at least. <laughs> um, you know, but, uh, no, I, I, the, the size that it's at now is great because we have, we're big enough that we can have great events like True Dungeon. We're big enough that we attract the attention of Wizards of the Coast where they send their entire D and D team. We get premier content and, you know, special treatment from, you know, major publishers without having, you know, lines at the bathroom and bullshit like that, you know, um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, I think this is where a real sweet spot here where we are now. This is a great time to be, to go to a show like, uh, like ours. Uh, I wish I could be an attendee. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty damn good. I'll tell you that. Yeah. We'll, we'll let you know. It's really, yeah, it's really fun <laughs> to go fun. to and, uh, the hosts are pretty good. And- yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and go to uh, make sure you stop by the uh, Gaming and BS uh, Saturday Night Reception, which will be going again this year. We're, oh yes, uh, that's, yes, that, that, that's all in the torpedo tube, ready to fire. Uh, so there's another half barrel of spotted cow lined up and ready for you guys. So that's we had a cool. Sean and I last year. We're like, I don't know, man, half barrel boy, that could be an expensive. Well, you know, what? we got the we got the money set aside. We'll do it. We'll probably end up having to give half the barrel back. I think they killed it like an hour or two or something. Oh, you're kidding me? Free beer? Holy (laughs) shit! Yeah, that's not gonna. Yeah, I wasn't sure how fast it would go, but that was like uh, that was it was a it was a uh, much more fun college keg party because it was all cool gamers, so it was fun. Uh Yeah, this year it's gonna be a twelve pack. So get there early. (laughs) Yeah. Sweet. It'll be really damn good beer though. Damn good. Twelve. Twelve. Twelve bottles. I'll get Kevin. I'll get Kevin to bring the beer. All right. There you go. Uh, we should do a beer exchange. We should. I did it at Gary Con. We should. We should do that too. Absolutely. Actually, somebody said. Uh, I thought I saw somebody was going to do a Scotch exchange. Hmm. Oof. For the high, high rolling Scotch drinkers out there. Uh, that could get that could get pricey. Yeah, one bottle. I guess yeah. maybe. Yeah, that can get pricey. Oh. Well, hey. Anyway. What are we talking about next week, Next Brett? week, um, we had a one of our listeners, Mr. Fitzpatrick, brought up uh, some questions that players uh, should ask themselves about their PCs. He had a pretty good little lineup for that. So that is our next topic, and we'll be dealing with, with that next week. Oh, I can't wait. Alex, anything you want to leave the listeners with, where they can find you, what you're going to be up to? Well, you know, uh, pop over to GameholeCon.com, create an account. Uh, we put uh, – we uh, – don't we try not to harry our attendees but we try to get a, a an email blast out once a month with updates uh because things happen and new, new sponsors come on board and meaning we can do new things uh updates on you know the, the the kind of games we're getting we're trying to give previews of some of the games um we have a, a very active facebook community as well um we have a forums page on the site so lots of you can interact with us any way you want it's a really nice community uh, that our, our attendees again as i've you know i keep beating this drum are such you know i'm so proud of the the people that come to our show um yeah, and then uh you know enjoy i guess and i hope that you come and uh and to those who've already supported us that's awesome and we love you and uh we're looking forward to seeing everyone in november Excellent. Thanks for joining us yet again. We always appreciate you on the show. We appreciate you putting on Game Hole Con and everything that you, you help us with as well. So thank you very much. Sure. All right. Well, for this has been another episode of Gaming NBS. I'm one of your hosts, Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. 
This episode of Gaming and BS brought to you with the help from the following patrons. Christian Sexy Voice Serrano, Kevin Lovecraft, Joe Swift, Brett's Biggest Fan, Jeff Rademacher, Forrest Gary, Mark Anthony Benedetti, Eric Jeppesen, Andy Hall, Sean Nicholson, Tim Jensen, Knights of the Night Crew, Palladium, Jason Blaylock, Remy Bilodeau, Jason Hobbs Hobbs, Wayne Humphrey, James Carpio, Not Caprio, Pure Mongrel, Lord Tentacle, Corey Johnston, Eric Tenkar, Brandon Barnes, Mark Tasaka, Brett Pazinski, Tim Shorts, Dan LaValle, C.W. Mellencamp, Craig Huber, Eli Kurtz, The Lost Sailor, Graham Miner, Todd McGowan, Roger Braslett, Misdirected Mark Productions, Old School DM, Jason, Christopher Gray, Stefan Dragonspawn, Finn Ulf, Ray Otis, Mirko Froelich, Eileen Barnes, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, Jared Rasher, Jared Lytle, Todd Crapper, Michael Parker, Jim Fitzpatrick, Michael Drescher with Static, Alexander Auerbach, Rodrigo Beowulf, Neil Benson, Ron Blessing, Evan Harrison Cass, Chris Steele, and Eric the Hoff Hoffman. For the cost of a coffee shop coffee, you could support the show for an entire month. Consider heading to GamingNBS.com forward slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, listeners. This This has has been been a Litterbox Studio production. production.